Chapter Twelve of *The Empty Sack* by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Twelve. Feeling that an explanation of her presence in the studio should come from herself, Jenny faltered, "I, I only looked in to say that if you hadn't found a model for, for the picture you wanted to paint, I might, I might be able to pose." Though she hadn't advanced and he hadn't moved. The extraordinary light in his eyes made her heart thump more wildly. "'You do it,' he held up the sketch. "'Dress like that.' She remembered his own phrase. "'If I am to be that kind of a model, I must be that kind of a model, and do what's expected.' The process of starving out being so far successful, Ray felt it well to push it a little more. He rose with an air of distress. "'I wish you could have told me this last week, Jenny.' "'As it is.' "'You've got someone else?' "'Not definitely. I've tried out three. Two of them no good, though the third might—' "'Might do as well as me?' "'Perhaps better in some ways. I mean,' he added hastily, as she seemed about to go, "'that she's a real professional model, and for this kind of job, of course, a professional would be, let us say, more at her ease.' So many good things had, during the past few days, swum into Jenny's vision, only to swim out again that she had grown almost used to this fading of her hopes. Nevertheless, the bliss of loving Hubert and getting twenty-five thousand dollars for it had seemed tolerably sure. To lose it now would be hard, but harder still, for the moment at least, was this tone of detachment, of indifference. That another woman should, in some ways, do better than herself was worse than the last indignity. Her lip trembled. She was about to turn away with that collapse of the figure which marks the woman who has lost all hope. He hurried up to her, laying his hand on her arm in a way that made a thrill run through her frame. "'Wait a minute, Jenny. I'd like to talk it over. If you want me to try you out—' "'What does that mean, try me out?' "'Oh, simply that you'd take the pose, that I could see how nearly you'd come up to what I want.' "'And then if I didn't?' He smiled. "'Oh, but you will. At least I think so.' "'When would you do it?' "'Oh, right now, as soon as you like. I've got the time.' She looked at him inquiringly, but there was nothing in his eyes to answer the question she was asking. "'Oh, very well,' she said dully, and once more turned towards the little door. She had taken a step or two when he said, suddenly, "'Jenny, what made you come back?' She paused, turned again, and pulled herself together. It was necessary to take the old bantering tone. After all, she could fence in her way as well as anybody else. "'Oh, I don't know,' she threw off carelessly. "'I thought I might as well.' "'Might as well what?' "'Oh, go in for the whole thing. As you say yourself, if you're to be that kind of a model.' "'And was that all?' "'All? It was a good deal, I should say.' "'It was a good deal, yes. But I asked if it was all.' "'Well, ask away, my boy. I don't have to answer you or go to jail, now do I?' extraordinary, the relief of falling back on studio badinage. It took her off to the Collingham stilts, away from the high-wrought Collingham emotions. She began to see what the trouble was with Bob. His touch wasn't light enough. He was too purposeful. He seemed to think you must mean something all the time. Mrs. Collingham, too, seemed to think so. It was not in Bob's language so much as in his cast of mind, but it was in his mother's cast of mind, and in her language, too. Jenny thought of this as she stood before the pier-glass in the little dressing-room, first taking off her jacket, and then unpinning her hat. She would have to do her hair on the top of her head, like the girl in Hubert's sketch. "'And that's all the clothes I shall need to put on,' she tried to say flippantly. She tried to say it flippantly, because that, too, would be along the line that people took who weren't Collingham's. People who weren't Collingham's. That meant all the people in Indiana Avenue— all the people in Pemberton Heights, the vast majority of the people in the United States, not to speak of any other country. Jenny had a good many acquaintances, and the family, taken as a whole, had more. But she couldn't think of anyone in that class who took life as more than a skimming on the surface. Outside the bounden duties which they couldn't avoid, they chiefly liked being silly. She thought of that, too, loosening her hair, and letting it fall in amber wavelets over her shoulders and down her back. Mrs. Coddingham had said that it was lovely hair, but she hadn't really seen it. There was so much of it that, 
when she piled it up like the girl in the sketch, it almost overweighted her delicate little face. No, whatever you could say about people like the Collinghams, you couldn't say they were silly. They had motives, opinions, points of view. They had minds, and they used them. They might not use them well, but to use them at all was better than to let them grow atrophied. Jenny, as has been said, had no words to express these thoughts, but like Pansy she could do without a vocabulary. She felt. She vibrated. She too had a mind, though she was afraid of putting it to work. Lingering over the piling of her hair, she wondered if the use or non-use of the mind marked the real line between people like the Collinghams and people like the Follets. Was that why the country was divided into highbrows and lowbrows, those who made the best of what they had, and those who disqualified themselves for all the stronger purposes? Since her peep at Marillo Park, she saw that something admitted one to such a haven, and something kept one out. There was money, of course, and position. But back of both position and money, wasn't it the case that there was mind? She threw off her blouse and lingered again to examine her arms and a bust. She lingered on purpose, putting off the extraordinary thing she had to do to the latest possible minute. At Collingham Lodge she had caught glimpses of books, papers, and magazines. Even in the birdcage they were lying on the table and chairs. The Follets hardly ever read a book. The only work of the kind she could remember the family ever to have bought was one called Ancient Rome Restored, which her mother had subscribed for in monthly parts when an agent had brought a sample to the house. It was at a time when Lizzie was afraid that her children, they were children still, would grow up without cultivation. Ancient Rome restored, being abundantly illustrated, called out in the young follicks the almost extinct Scarborough of the tradition. Having no other important picture books to look at, they pored over the glories of the Forum, of Hadrian's Villa, of the bars of Caracalla, till an odd, incipient love of classic beauty began to stir in them. But there their cultivation ended. In the papers they studied only the murders, burglaries, and comic cuts. In the way of general entertainment, the movies formed their sole relaxation, but unless the play was silly, they complained. Anything that asked for thought they kicked against, and Pemberton Heights kicked with them. Was that why there was a Pemberton Heights and a Marillo Park? Did the power of thought control the difference between them? Was it that where there was little or no power of thought, there was little or nothing of anything else? She unhooked her skirt and let it slip down to a circular heap about her feet. She wondered if the girl who would, in some ways, do better than herself, were as lithely built as she. Mrs. Collingham had lightened her to— Oh, what was it? It was a spa. It sounded like a chapel. She had tossed it off as something that everybody knew about. So she had tossed off other names, taking it for granted that Jenny would have had them at her fingers' ends. The more she pondered— the more sure of it she became, that she and her kind were poor and helpless, chiefly because they wouldn't take the trouble to be otherwise. Not to stray from the childish to the sentimental and the obvious, gave them the relief she found in returning to the lingo she had always used with Ray. She had used it with Bob too, only with Bob she had used it differently. Perhaps it was he who had used it differently. Between her and Ray it had never been more than the medium of chaff, except on those occasions when it had become the vehicle of a half-acknowledged passion. Bob had tried to say something with it, even when slangy or colloquial. He treated her as, as if she was worth talking to. He had tried to make her feel that she could talk on better themes than any they had ever broached. Poor Bob, sailing away to the south, thinking that where he left her, there he would find her. Little he knew— if he could only see her now, if he could only dream of what she would be doing in ten minutes' time, if he only— Something made her shudder. She felt cold. Perhaps the wind had changed outside, as it often did in May. She stooped, picked up her skirt, and mechanically hooked it round her. Still feeling chilled, she crossed her arms and hugged herself. A minute or two later she had put on her blouse and her jacket. She meant to take them off again as soon as she stopped shivering— Already Hubert would be cursing her delay. She thought of the light in his eyes when she told him that, 
after all she had come to pose. The memory of it made her heart jump again with a great single throb. It was the caveman's light. She never saw it in Bob's, and never would. Bob's eyes were twinkling and kind. She didn't suppose she would ever see such kind eyes in anyone else. If kindness were what she wanted. Beginning to feel warmer, she noticed how grotesque her hair was with her spring sport suit. She had stuck it through a great skewer with a handful of artificial jade, which she had used with some other costume. But the high crown of hair was so little in keeping with the rest of her that she pulled out the skewer and the other pins, again letting the glinting cataract tumble down. Why had Bob never asked her if she loved him? Hubert had done it a hundred, perhaps a thousand times. Bob had seemed to think that his loving her covered all possible conditions. What he had to give her was always the theme of his enthusiasm, as if she were a beggar who could give nothing in return. With Hubert, it was what he was to get from her. She was the richly dowered one who could offer or withhold. He would take all, and give nothing. Well, let him. It was what she wanted, to be drained dry. If she was to give herself up, she would give herself up. When Hubert had done with her, he would chuck her on the scrap heap like her father. That was the way she loved him. That was the way to be loved. Cave men didn't watch lest you should get damp feet, or have their lives insured for you. Their love was passion, a fire that burned you up and left you a white bit of ash. And yet, to be burned up and left a white bit of ash was something for which she was not yet prepared. She didn't say this to herself. All of a sudden she was terrified. Whatever instincts governed her went into the nimbleness of her fingers as she began flattening her hair so as to put on her hat. She didn't know why she was doing this. She didn't even know that she wanted to get away. It was just a wild impulse to be back as the everyday Jenny Follett. The girl in the Byzantine chair was out of the question for today. Tomorrow, perhaps. Probably. Quite surely. But for today she must still belong for a few more hours to herself. Hubert might come thumping any minute on the door, and if he found her dressed for the street. And just then he did come thumping on the door. Jenny, for God's sake, what's the matter? Are you dead? She gasped. It would have been a relief if she could have fainted. All she could do was to thrust the last pin into her hat and go to the door and open it. Hubert stood aghast. Well, by all the holy cats! I'm not well, Mr. Ray, she pleaded with sudden inspiration. Ah, oh, go on, Jenny, you were well enough twenty minutes ago. Yes, but since then I've been feeling chilled. He strode into the dressing-room, which he was not supposed to do. Chilled? Hell, why, this hole's as hot as blazes. It isn't that. I think it's a germ-cold I'm taking. See here, Jenny, he said sternly. You're going to funk it. All right, doesn't make much difference to me. The other girl, it's Emma Brasshead, you, you know. She was the middle one in Sims' three nudes. Perfectly stunning hips. I'll be here tomorrow, right on the dot. He wheeled away as far as the space of the dressing-room would permit. Oh, well, Jenny, I don't know that it would be of much use. After all, Emma's the type, you see. You'd be too... You can't tell that till, till you've tried me out. I can try you out right through your clothes. What's a man a painter for? If you can do that, why did you want me to... He turned sharply. Jenny, you're not straight with me. Oh, but I am. I'm as straight with you as, as you are with me. But I can't help being sick. You can't help being Jenny, he muttered brokenly. The girl I worship and who worships me. Jenny, Jenny, Jenny. Oh, don't, Hubert, don't, she begged. Tomorrow, I'll come tomorrow and then. But he smothered these protests. You wildcat, you adorable tigress. Yes, Hubert, but tomorrow. No, no. His kisses, his brutalities, were agony to her, and yet they were bliss. She didn't know why she fought them off, or what instinct led her to defend herself, or how she found herself out on the stairs. She went down slowly. She was not angry, she was only excited and a little amused. Sex fury was less romantic than she had supposed. But as an exhibition of the human being at his most animal, it was some curtain-raiser. If she had to go through it again! But as she jogged towards the ferry and the street-car, this mood passed off. 
she grew sick with a sense of failure. Love and twenty-five thousand dollars were at stake, and she had funked the game. She was not a sport. She wondered if she were a woman. If she couldn't play out better than this, she would have Bob back on her hands again and be shamed forever before Mrs. Collingham, who had been so good to her. Moreover, if she continued to play fast and loose with Ray, he would certainly return to Miss Brasshead. She dreaded reaching the ferry and having to go on the boat. The river was now haunted by Bob, like the sea by a phantom ship. While crossing, she sat with her eyes closed, so as to shut out this memory by not looking at the water. Arriving on the New Jersey side, she was so much earlier than she usually returned, and so dispirited, that she decided to walk home, threading the way through sordid streets till she climbed the more cleanly ascent to the heights. The heights has a common as well as a square, and Jenny's way took her through the great shady grass-plot, where men were lounging on benches, nurses wheeling their babies, and boys playing baseball. Round the common are civic monuments of Pemberton Heights, the bank, the post-office, the hospital, the engine-house, and the public library. Jenny looked at this last as if she had never seen it before. As a matter of fact, she never had seen it before. She had looked at it more times than she could count, but with the eyes only. She knew what it was. She had actually watched the coquettish red-brick building, with its glass dome and white Grecian portico, rising at the command of the great philanthropist whose name the building bore. But she had never been conscious of its purpose, as related to herself. Now, for the first time, it occurred to her that here was a place where a reader could find a books. With no very clear idea in her mind, she stepped it within. The interior was hushed, rather awesome, yet sunny and sweetly solemn, like the temple of some cheerful god. Finding herself confronted by a kindly, bookish little lady seated at a table behind a wooden barrier, it was obviously Jenny's duty to address her. "'I wonder if I could borrow a book?' She was informed that she could borrow three books at a time, as soon as certain inquiries as to her identity and residence were carried out, and this would take a few days. But in a few days Jenny knew that her desire to read might be dead, and said so. The object of the library being to encourage young people to read, rather than to be too particular about their addresses, the kindly little lady, after some consultation with a kindly little gentleman, filled out Jenny's card. Uh, "'What sort of book were you thinking of? A novel?' Jenny said, "'Yes, if it was a good one.' "'This is one of the best,' the little lady went on, pushing forward a volume that happened to be lying at her hand. "'If you care to take it.' It was The Egoist by George Meredith, and Jenny accepted it as something foreordained. "'You could have two more books if you wanted them, now that you're here.' Jenny made a plunge. "'Have you anything about—about about spires?' The lady smiled gently. "'About church spires?' The girl thought it was. Chapel spires, especially French ones. The kindly little gentleman, being accustomed to this kind of search, was called into council. In the end she selected a work on the old churches of Paris, which she thought might give her the information she desired. "'And now a third book?' Here— she was on safer ground. The English name had caught her ear with more precision than the foreign ones. "'Have you got anything about a, a Lady Hamilton?' "'You mean Romney's Lady Hamilton?' Again there was an echo from Jenny's memory. Romney was the man who couldn't paint her because he was too Georgian. She began to see how Mrs. Collingham could play with names as she might with tennis balls. Since there was nothing else at Marillo Park, there must also be a public library.' Arriving at home, she secreted her volumes under her bed. She could read at night, and by scraps in the daytime. If Ted or Gussie were to learn that she was trying to inform her mind, they would guy her with as little mercy as if they caught her in that still more offensive crime, the improvement of her speech. End of chapter 12《ハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッ
that Bob Collingham was at ease in his conscience as to sailing to South America and leaving behind him an unacknowledged wife will hardly be supposed. But the true situation did not present itself to him till after he and Jenny had said their good-byes. He had tried to see her again on the following day to take counsel as to the immediate publication of their marriage, and only her refusal to meet him had frustrated that intention. But the more he pondered, the more the thing he had done seemed little to his credit. On the morning of the day on which he sailed, he rose with a resolve to tell the whole truth to his father. Had he known the facts, that Jenny had actually been to Collingham Lodge, that his mother knew of the marriage, that his father, without knowing of the marriage, was aware of his infatuation, he would have made a clean breast of it. But, the habit of domestic life being strong, it seemed impossible to spring the confession in the middle of a peaceful breakfast. His mother had come down to the table for this parting meal, and was already half in tears. His father concealed a genuine emotion behind the morning paper. Edith said she wondered what would happen to them all before they met again. The possibilities evoked were so significant that the mother said, sharply, "'I hope it may be God's will that we shall meet exactly as we are, a united family.' "'We could still be a united family,' Edith ventured, "'and not meet exactly as we are.' "'Edith, please,' her mother had begged, and Bob felt it out of the question to add to her distress. Edith, having driven to the dock with his father and himself, there was only the slightest opportunity for a private word between the father and the son. That came at a minute when Edith was talking to Mr. and Mrs. Huntley on the deck of the Demerara. "'Dad,' Bob asked, awkwardly and abruptly, "'do you feel quite at ease in your mind as to old man Follett?' Passengers and their friends were pushing and jostling, Collingham was obliged to brace himself against the rod running along the line of cabins before he could reply. "'Why do you ask?' "'Because I don't.' "'You don't with regard to my stand, or, or with regard to your own?' The boy looked his father in the eyes. "'With regard to yours, Dad?' Well, "'That's very kind of you, Bob. But may I suggest that you'll have all you can do in repenting of your own sins, without trying in addition to repent of mine?' Nevertheless, when the minute came, the parting was affectionate. Neither father nor son was satisfied with a handshake. Throwing their arms about each other, they kissed, as in the days when Bob was a little boy. Perhaps it was the warmth of this farewell that induced the father, on arriving at the bank, to ask Miss Ruddick to invite Mr. Bickley to the private office in case he should look round that afternoon. Mr. Bickley did look round that afternoon, and was accordingly ushered in. He was a delicately built man whose appearance produced that effect of accuracy you get from a steel trap. Constructed to do a certain kind of work, he can do that work and no other. Two minutes after Bickley had looked at the man, he knew both his weak points and his aptitudes, and could tell to a nicety the job it was best to put him to. Forehead, nose, jaw, lips, eyes and ears were to him as the letters of the alphabet. More than once he had transferred a teller to the accounting department, or made an accountant a detective by his reading of facial lines. Having put his man in an armchair, and given him one of the Havanas he kept for social intercourse, Collium waited for the mellow moment when the cigar was smoked to half its length. "'Do you know, Bickley,' he said then, "'I've never been quite at ease in my mind about the way we shelved that old fellow for it. it. Seems to me we showed, well, let us call it a bond of consideration.' Bickley's eyes measured what was left of his cigar, as he held it out before him horizontally. A consideration for whom, Mr. Collingham? Well, for the old man himself. Oh, I didn't know but what you were going to say for your stockholders. Before the banker could parry this thrust, the expert went on. I looked in yesterday at the courtroom where they were trotting out that fellow Nicholson of the Wyndham National. If they'd ever asked me, I could have told them long ago that they'd lose money by him in the end. Oh, but Follett isn't in that box. "'He is, if you drop money by him. "'I am speaking not of the ways you drop money by a man, "'but only of the fact that you drop it. "'Your business, I suppose, Mr. Collingham, "'is to make money for your shareholders and yourself. "'It's to help out that, I take it, "'that you send for me and go by my advice.' "'Then you class Follett and Nicholson together?' "'I don't class them at all. "'Whether a man steals the bank's money "'or you give it to him as a gift isn't to the point.' My job is over when I tell you that he gets what he doesn't earn. The rest, Mr. Collingham, is up to you. 
nor all the district attorney, as the case may be. Oh, I'm afraid I don't see it in that way. It's your affair, Mr. Collingham, not mine. I only venture to remind you that we've had this little tussle over almost every man we've ever bounced. It does great credit to your kindness of heart, and if you want to go on supporting Follett and his family for the rest of your life— Collingham winced at this hint that his kindness of heart was greater than his business capacity. It was a point at which he always felt himself vulnerable. Uh, "'Speaking of Follett's family,' he said, gliding away from the main topic, "'we've got that boy of his here. How's he getting on?' "'Ah, there you have a horse of another colour. My first report of him was not so favourable. But now that we've knocked the high jinks out of him—' <laughs> "'We've done that, have we?' "'He's on the way to become a valuable boy.' "'Good worker, cheery, likeable. "'If he can get over his one defect, he'll be worth hanging on to.' "'And his one defect is? "'Liable to get excited and lose his head. "'Type to see red in a fight, and to do something dangerous.' "'Unaware of the effort which his former employer's goodwill "'was vainly putting forth on his behalf, "'Josiah arrived in front of his pair of grass-plots in Indiana Avenue. "'It was a trim little place.' meeting all the wishes for a roof above his head which his soul had ever formed. He stood and looked at it, thinking of the days when little laddies used to play house beneath one of the umbrella-shaped hydrangea bushes. That was not so long ago, only six or eight years. It was nine since he had bought number eleven, paying out three thousand dollars that had come to him from a matured twenty years endowment policy, together with another thousand Lizzie had inherited from an aunt. They had thought it a good investment because— if the worst ever came to the worst, and they didn't know what they meant by that, they would always have a home. Now the home was in danger, because he couldn't raise a hundred and forty-seven dollars and sixty-three cents. He had been everywhere trying to borrow more, and he had failed. He had got to the point where his acquaintances in the different offices were putting him down as an old bum. To Josiah, knowing all the shades of meaning in the term, it was a dreadful name as applied to himself— and he had heard it that very afternoon. An old friend who promised to lend him five of the hundred and fifteen already raised had said on seeing him approach, "'Here comes that old bum again.' Josiah had turned about there and then. Giving up trying any more to raise the hundred and forty-seven, he had wandered home. He, Josiah Follett, an old bum. Having hidden her three volumes under the bed, Jenny looked out and saw him. He didn't look specially dejected, yet she knew he was. She knew it by the way he stared at the hydrangea bush, or by the fact that he'd renounced his search for another job so early in the afternoon. Like herself, he seemed thrown on his own resources for company, finding little or nothing there. She ran down to meet him. She would do that rare thing in the Follett family, take him for a walk. He turned with her obediently. It was a relief to him not to be obliged to go in at once and tell Lizzie he had no good news. Lizzie was still his great referee, as he was hers. The children were still the children, not to be taken into confidence, till there was nothing else to be done. But this afternoon life, for the first time, looked different. It was as if, unaided, he couldn't carry the burden any more. There were younger shoulders than his, and perhaps it was time now to call on them to share the task. "'I'm an old man, Jenny,' he said, as they began to move slowly towards Palisade Walk. "'I haven't felt old till lately, but now, now I'm all done in. "'I don't suppose I'll ever get a chance to do a day's work again.' When she rallied him on this, he told her the story of his day, omitting the old bum incident. He must spare his children that, even if he couldn't have been spared himself. This tale, delivered without emphasis— was more terrible to Jenny than all the pangs of conscience. Had she been but true to the promises made to Mrs. Collingham, she could have said, "'Father, dear, you'll never have to worry any more.' Two hours earlier, twenty-five thousand dollars had been within her grasp, and she had let it go. "'All that money,' she sighed to herself, "'and love.' But since it would be within her grasp to-morrow, a new thought came to her. The hundred dollars she would ultimately return to Bob need not be in exactly the same bills. There was no reason why she should not use this amount and restore it from the wealth to come. Bob couldn't possibly tell the difference between the paper that made up one sum of a hundred dollars 
and the paper that made up another. She would have preferred to hand it back without touching it, but in view of the family need, fastidiousness was out of place. As they emerged into Palisade Walk, and the vast panorama lay below them, she slipped her arm through his. "'Daddy,' she said caressingly, "'what would you say if you saw me with a hundred dollars?' To Josiah it was the kind of question children ask when their imaginations go off on flights. It would have been the same thing had she said a thousand or a million. Nevertheless, he replied more gravely than she had expected, "'What should I say, my dear? I should say you couldn't have come by it honestly.' "'Oh, but if I could?' "'No use talking about that, my dear, because I know you couldn't. If you had a hundred dollars, some man would have given it to you. No man would give it to you unless—' He didn't finish the sentence, because she hurried on ahead. He reached her only when she stood still, looking down on the river, to spring the question prepared on second thoughts. "'But, Daddy, if I had a hundred dollars, you'd use it for the taxes, wouldn't you, even if I hadn't got it honestly?' A spasm crossed his face. He laid his hand on her shoulder roughly. She could think of nothing but the stern father of a wayward girl— as she had seen him pictured in the movies. She hadn't suspected that such dramatic parents existed off the screen. "'Janey, you haven't got a hundred dollars. Tell me you haven't. Don't let me think that the worst thing of all has overtaken us.' Amazed as she was, her feminine quick-wittedness came to her aid. "'Are oh, you funny, Daddy?' she laughed, drawing his hand from her shoulder and again slipping it through her arm. "'You're not a bit good at making pretend.' "'Excuse me, my dear.' he said humbly, as they strolled on once more. "'I'm a little nervous. I don't suppose I'll ever get a chance to do a day's work again.' Jenny, too, was a little nervous, though she did her best to hide the fact. She had not expected him to take this tragically moral point of view. It made so many new complications as to her twenty-five thousand that she didn't know where she stood. Her mother might agree with him. Teddy and the girls might agree with her. To act in opposition to them all, was outside her sphere of contemplation. Indiana Avenue was indeed not so primitive, but that the subject of ladies who chose their own way was frequently under discussion, and Jenny had never heard much condemnation of this liberty, except where the associations were considered low. Where, on the contrary, the situation was on a large financial scale and carried with it a lordly hand, opinion, while not approving, was in a measure deferential. It was no secret that Mrs. Ingalls had a sister, mysteriously known as Mrs. Derrimore, whose career had been of the most romantic, and whenever her limousine drove up to the Ingalls' door, as it did perhaps twice a year, all the women crowded to the windows to see the fair occupant get in and out. On one occasion Jenny had heard her mother say to her next-door neighbour, Mrs. Weatherby, "'After all, with the kind of world we've got today, why shouldn't she?' Jenny had not thought of herself as a second Mrs. Derrimore. She had hardly thought of herself at all. The combination of Hubert, love, and the family deliverance from penury had precluded speculation as to what she might become. She made no attempt to call up this vision even now. The irony of a situation in which she had a small fortune tucked away in the glove and handkerchief box in her top bureau drawer, and yet was helpless to make use of it, was enough for her to deal with. Palisade Walk is protected by a row of small, irregular, upright boulders, like the dragon's teeth. At a spot where a low, flat stone forms a seat between two granite cones, Jenny sat down sidewise to the river, to think her situation out. Josiah, too, came to a standstill, leaning on the stick which lifelong British habit put into his hands whenever he went out of doors, and gazing at a scene whose very mightiness smote him through and through with a sense of his futility. It was a view of New York which few New Yorkers know to exist, and which those who know it to exist mainly ignore. Rio from the Pas de Ascar, Montreal from Montreal, Quebec from the St. Lawrence, San Francisco from the Golden Gate, are all of the earth, earthy. Manhattan, as viewed from the Hudson's rest and bank, is like the city which rose when Apollo sang, or that beheld in the apocalypse of John. From the dragon's teeth the precipice broke in terraces and shelves, hung with ash, sumac, and stunted oak. Wherever there was a hand's breadth of soil, a dandelion or a violet, 
a buttercup or a lady fern, nestled in the keeping of the cliff as a bird's nest on a branch. Creepers and vines threw their tangles of tassels down to where the chimneys clustering along the river's brink blackened them with smoke. Small, water-worn docks, sheltering nameless craft, battered, ancient and grotesque, crept in and out among factories and coal-yards, linking up with one another in a line of some twenty miles. Straight as the cut of a knife, the river clove its tremendous gash from Adirondacks to Atlantic, a leaden, shimmering, storied streak, too deep within its bed to catch the westering sunlight. The westering sunlight itself was silvered in the perpetual misty haze hanging over the island like an aureole, through which the city glimmered in mile after mile of gable and spire, of dome and cube, silent, suspended, heavenly. There is nothing in the world like this cloud-built vision garlanded along the sky. No sound breaks from it, no sign of our earth-born life. The steel-blue grey of a gull's wing swooping above the water is gross as compared with its texture. The violet and the lady fern are not so delicate as the substance of its palaces. It might be dream, it might be mirage, it might be the city which came down from God as a bride adorned for her husband. Beginning too far away for the eye to reach, and ending where the gaze can no longer follow, it is immense and yet aerial, a towered, battlemented, mighty thing, yet spun of the ether between the worlds. Though Jenny and her father had looked at this mystic wraith of a city so often that they hardly noticed it any more, they were never free from its ecstatic influence. That is, it moved them to aspirations without suggesting the objective to which they should aspire. Caught in the web of daily circumstance, entangled, enmeshed, helplessly captive amid hands-to-mouth necessities, their thoughts were rarely at liberty to wander from the definite calculation as to how to live. They didn't so wander even now. Even now, lifted up as they were among spiritual splendours, food, clothes, gas, taxes, and the mortgage, were the things most heavily on their minds. But something else stirred them with a sluggish will to live. Jenny, do you believe in God? For a minute Jenny gazed sideways at the celestial city in the air, and made no answer. Josiah himself hardly knew why he had asked the question, unless it was because of vague new fears as to Jenny's associations. Of these he knew almost as little as the parent bird of its offspring's doing when the young have taken flight. This was the custom of the family, the custom of the country. But he had never been free from misgivings that Jenny's calling of artist's model was not respectable, and now this mention of a hundred dollars, even though it were but in jest, roused some little-used sense of paternal responsibility. "'I don't know that I do,' Jenny said at last. She added, after another minute's thought, "'What's the good of God, anyhow?' "'People say he can take you to heaven when you die, or, or send you to the other place.' "'I'm not worrying about what will happen when I die. I've got all I can attend to here. Can God help me about that?' It was the test question of Josiah's inner life. His faith stood or fell by it. He would have been glad to tell his child that she could be aided in her earthly problems, but, unlike Job, hadn't he himself served God for naught? "'He don't seem able to do that, my dear,' he sighed, as if the confession of unbelief forced its way out in spite of himself. "'Well, then,' Jenny rose wearily, What's the use? If God can put me off till I die, I suppose I can put him off in the same way, can't I? Do you believe in him yourself, Daddy? I used to. And that was all he could say. As the sun sank farther into the west, the celestial city, which had hitherto been of a luminous white, was shot with rose and saffron. Within its heart lay Broadway, Fifth Avenue, Wall Street, and the Bowery, Shops, churches, brothels, and banks, all passions, hungers, yearnings, and ambitions, all national tendencies worthy and detestable, all human instincts holy and unclean, all loveliness, all lust, all charity, all cupidity, all secret and suppressed desire, 
all shameless exposure on the housetops, all sorrow, all sin, all that the soul of man conceives of evil and good. And yet, with no more than these few miles of perspective, and this easy play of light translated into beauty, uplifting, unearthly, and ineffable. For a minute longer, Jenny and her father looked on the vision as it melted from glory to glory in this pageantry of sky. Then, with arms linked as before, they turned their backs on it. End of chapter 13《Chapter fourteen of the Empty Sack by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter fourteen. For the next twenty four hours, Jenny did her best to suspend the operation of thought. Thought got her nowhere. It led her into so many blind alleys that it made her head ache. She once heard a returned traveller describe his efforts to get out of the labyrinth at Hampton Court, and felt herself now in the same situation. Each way seemed easy till she followed it and found herself balked by a hedge. But the fact that her head ached gave her an excuse for her going to her room and locking herself in. She could thus pull her books from beneath the bed without fear of detection. The points as to which she needed enlightenment being Spires and Lady Hamilton, she went at her task with the avidity of a starving person at sight of food. As to Spires, she was quickly appeased, for her volume on the old churches of Paris had the Saint-Chapelle as its frontispiece. Now that she had seen the name in print, she was sure of it. Because of being so little taxed, her memory was the more retentive. Every sound that had fallen from Mrs. Collingham's lips was stamped on her mind like a footprint hardened into rock on a bit of untracked soil. Within half an hour she had learned the outlines of the history of the Saint-Chapelle, and, with some flattering of timid vanity, had grasped the comparison of its strong and exquisite grace with her own personality. But, after all, the Saint-Chapelle was a thing of stone, whereas Lady Hamilton—she loved the name—must have been of flesh and blood. Here, too, there was a frontispiece, the very Diane of the Frick Gallery to which Mrs. Collingham had referred. Unfortunately, the illustrations were in black and white, so that she could get no adequate idea as to the complexion or the colour of the hair. The face, however, with its bewitching softness, its heavenly archnesses, bore some resemblance to her own. It was a shock to learn that the possessor of so much beauty, the bearer of so melodious a title, had begun life as Emma Lyon, a servant girl. But after all, she reflected, the circumstance only created analogies with herself. There were more analogies still. Emma Lyon had been an artist's model. In an artist's studio she had made the acquaintance of men of lofty station, just as she herself had met Bob. She had loved and been loved. Romney was perhaps her Hubert Ray. Her career had been exciting and dramatic, the friend of a queen, the more than wife of one of the great men of the age. The tragic, miserable death didn't frighten Jenny, since misery and tragedy always stalked on the edge of her experience. She fell asleep amid vast, vague concepts of queens and heroes, beset with loves and problems not unlike Jenny Follett's. All through the next day she stilled the working of thought by application to the egoist. She took to it as to a drug. In the intervals of her household duties, or whenever her mind became active over her affairs, she ran to her room to begin again. Comedy is a game played to throw reflections upon social life, and it deals with human nature in the drawing-room of civilised men and women, where we have no dust of the struggling outer world, no mire, no violent clashes, to make the correctness of the representation convincing. She got little farther, since for her purpose this was far enough. She was drugged already, as by dentist's gas. The more she read, the more she felt herself wandering sleepily through realms of dream, where words, as she understood them, had ceased to have significance. So, by sheer force of will, she brought herself to that moment in the afternoon when she stood at the studio door. She hadn't thought, she hadn't, in her own phrase, imagined. She had allowed herself no instant in which to count the cost or to shrink from paying it. Hubert 
love, and the family deliverance from poverty would be hers before nightfall, and she meant not to look beyond. She opened the door softly. Before showing herself she stopped and listened. There was not a sound. It was often so if Hubert was painting, and the silence only assured her that if he was there, as he probably was, he was waiting for her alone. He's waiting for her alone, with that look in his eyes, that maddened animal look which she had seen yesterday, so bestial and yet so compelling. Still more softly, she moved forward among the studio odds and ends. Then she saw, and stopped. In the Byzantine chair, a nude woman, seated in the manner of the Egyptian cat goddess, was holding up a skull. Though the woman looked the other way, Jenny could see her as a lovely creature, straight, strong, triumphant, and unashamed. Hubert was painting, busily, eagerly. He raised his eyes, saw Jenny as she cowered, took no notice of her at all, and went on with his work. It passed all that she had ever imagined of cruelty, that, as she turned to make her way out again, he should glance up once more, and let her go. Hubert! And the woman dressed like that! The woman dressed like that in this intimacy with Hubert! She herself, shut out, cast out, sent to the devil! Someone else in her place, when she might so easily have kept it! Jenny's suffering was in the dry and stony stage at which it hardly seemed suffering at all. Yes, it did. She knew it was suffering. Only she couldn't feel. She could think lucidly, and yet put the whole situation away from her for the reason that it would keep. Anguish would keep. Tears would keep. She could postpone everything, since she had all the rest of her life to give to its contemplation. Just for the present, the memory of the woman in the chair, with Hubert looking at her, was so scorching to the mind that she could do nothing but snatch her faculties away from it. Coming to Fifth Avenue and seeing an electric bus stop near the curb, she climbed into it. It was the old story of not knowing where to go or what to do once her simple round of habits had been upset. Snuggled close to a window, she could at least be jolted along without effort of her own while she still fought off the consciousness of the frightful thing that had happened. It was not merely Hubert and the woman. It was everything. So much was included that she couldn't bear to think of this ruin to her beautiful house of cards. Such wealth and beauty in the shop windows. Such streams of people in their new spring clothes. She had heard it said that every heart had its bitterness, but she didn't think that that could be possible. If everyone had a heartache like hers, or even the memory of such a heartache, it would make too monstrous a world, too deplorable a human race. After all, there must be some sense in the presence of mankind on earth, and if all were kicked about and bruised, there would be none. She preferred to think that the people on the pavements and in the limousines were as happy as they looked, and that she alone was selected for bewilderment and pain. She wondered where she was going. There was a ferry far up on the Riverside Drive which would take her across to New Jersey, and thence, by a combination of trolley-cars, she could work her way southward to Pemberton Heights. This would consume an hour or more, and so eat up part of the afternoon. What she would do when she arrived home with her dreams all shattered, God alone knew. If she could only have seen her friend, Mrs. Collingham, clinging to that kind hand as she poured out her heart. Just then a huge building came into sight on the left, and with it a new impulse— she had often meant to visit it, though the day never seemed to come. Gussie had once gone to the Metropolitan Museum in company with Sadie Ingalls, since when she had been in the habit of saying that she had as good as taken a trip abroad. Jenny didn't want a trip abroad. She wanted soothing, comforting, affection. She wanted another drop of that experienced womanly sympathy, instinct with kindliness and knowledge of the world, which she had tasted for the first and only time on that blissful afternoon at Collingham Lodge. It was to get nearer to Collingham Lodge that she left the bus to drag herself up the long flight of steps and into the vast, cool hall. There were others going in, chief to the Slavs and Italians, for whom she felt a legitimate Anglo-Saxon contempt, so that she had nothing to do but to follow them. 
Then she found herself at the top of another long flight of steps, gazing about her in an awe that soon became an intoxicating sense of beauty. It was Jenny's first approach to beauty on this scale of immensity and variety. It was her first draught of art. Her childhood's poring over ancient Rome restored had given her a feeling for line and economy, but she had never dreamed that colour, substance, and texture could be used with this daring, profuse creativeness. Having no ability to seize details, she drifted helplessly up and down aisles of splendour and gleam. Here there were gold and silver, here was a tapestry, here crystal, here enamel. The pictures were endless, endless. She could no more deal with them than with the sunset. Life came to the Scarborough tradition in her, as it does to a frozen limb, with distress, and yet with an element of ecstasy. A soul that had passed to a higher plane of existence, whom there was no one to welcome and guide, might have ventured timidly into the celestial land, as Jenny among these lovely things outside her comprehension. She came to herself, as it were, on hearing a man's voice say, in a kind of tone and idiom with which she was familiar, "'Have you looked at this Cellini now? "'That's the only authentic bit of Cellini in the United States. "'There are six or seven other pieces in different museums "'that people say is Cellini, but there's always a hitch in the proof.' "'Turning, she saw a stocky man in custodian's uniform "'who was addressing a group of Italians, two bareheaded women, three children between ten and fifteen, and a man. "'All were interested, all studied the gold shell "'with its dragon-shaped handle in purplish enamel.' They commented, criticised, appraised, even the children pointing out excellences to one another. When they drifted away, Jenny turned to the kindly Irishman, who, by dint of living with beauty, had grasped its spirit, and put a hesitating question. She asked him to repeat the name of the goldsmith, pronouncing it after him till she registered it on her mind, as she had that of Lady Hamilton. "'Sure there was an artist for you,' the custodian went on. "'The breed is dead and gone.' "'Hot-tempered fellow, though. "'Had more mistresses and killed more men than you could count. "'Should read about him in a book he wrote himself.' "'He looked at Jenny from the corner of an eye, "'accustomed to size up an individual here and there "'among the thousands who floated daily through his little domain, "'apparently finding in her something that merited further favours. "'Are you wise to this memling?' he asked, "'leading the way to a corner of the wall where hung a small portrait.' "'There are only two other men in the world that could have painted that head, "'and that's Holbein and Rembrandt. "'Melming himself never did it, but just that once.' "'Jenny looked, registering Memling's name. "'It was the head of an elderly man, "'so living, kindly, and humorous that she loved him. "'When she turned to her guide he stood with a smile of curiosity, "'like that of a mother showing her baby to a friend. "'What do you say to that now?' "'Jenny said what she could.' that it was marvellous, but that she didn't know anything about art. Since he was so kind, she ventured, however, on another question. Did the museum contain a portrait of Lady Hamilton? He pursed up his nose. Not a good one, not a Romney. There was one in Gallery 24, but it was by John Opie, of whom he had no high opinion. In comparison with Romney, he thought Opie big and coarse, but since there was nothing better to be seen, Jenny might choose to glance at this second-rate specimen. "'And I'll tell you another thing,' he went on confidentially. "'You're not used to looking at pictures and such like, are you now?' Jenny said she was not. "'Well, then, go to Gallery 24. Find your Opie, which you'll see hanging over one of the doors, and don't look at anything else. You'll have seen all you can absorb in one day. Come back tomorrow, or any other time, and come straight to me. You'll find me here, and I'll tell you what to look at next. But don't take more today than you can enjoy.' He walked with her till she reached the boundary of his realm. "'You look like a girl that have an eye and a taste for beauty. You don't find them often among Americans, and when you do it's a godsend. Poles, Jews, Russians, yes. When the French and Italian officers was in New York, their eyes did fairly eat the museum up. But Americans, they don't know and they don't want to know. Not one in a hundred thousand. Well, good day to you and good luck.' "'I am always here, and I am just the one to tell you which is the things to pick out.' But by the time she discovered her Lady Hamilton, she had only the courage to note listlessly that the hair was somewhat the colour of her own, not chestnut, 
not russet, not copper, not red gold, but perhaps a combination of them all. She had reached her limitations unexpectedly. The tide she had dammed had burst its barriers and rushed in on her. She sank to a chair in the middle of the almost empty room, her eyes blinded by sudden tears. Hubert was still with that woman. The woman was perhaps resting now, and they were talking. She would be so much at her ease that she would talk without taking the trouble to throw her wrap round her. Hubert, too, would be at ease preferring her without her wrap rather than with it. In vain she reminded herself that the situation was one to which an artist was accustomed. She hadn't been in a studio for a year without learning that much, though she got no comfort from it now. No comfort was possible with the vision of this naked magnificence seared on her memory. Hubert had let her come without a welcome, and go without a protest. He was probably glad when she went, so that he might be alone with this wanton who didn't know shame. In the end she saw but one course before her. She would make the best of Bob. To do so would mean that Bob would be disinherited by his ogre of a father. But with Mrs. Collingham's aid a counteracting influence might be found. Moreover, she could thus return home, confess herself Bob's wife, and offer the hundred dollars to her father as cash lawfully her own. Life would be simplified in this way, even though happiness were dead. She was the last of the commuting family to reach the house that evening, and on crossing the threshold was greeted with a sense of cheer. It did not mean much to her at first, for, with the optimism of her hand-to-mouth existence, a sense of cheer was the last thing the family ever abandoned. She herself cast all outward air of trouble away from her on opening the door, because it was in the tradition. Her father was seated, quietly smoking his pipe, which he had not done for the past week or more. Gussie held the middle of the floor, her arms extended in a serpentine wave, humming a dance tune and practising the step. To mark the rhythm, Gladys was clapping her hands with a slow tom-tom beat. Pansy alone stood apart, blinking and unresponsive, as if for reasons of her own she considered this mirth ill-timed. "'Look, Jen,' Gladys giggled as her eldest sister passed down the room, "'this is the new thing at the Washington. Gus has got it so you wouldn't know her from Samarine himself.' Jenny went on to the kitchen, where, as she expected, her mother was getting the supper, and did her best to be nonchalant. "'Hello, Mamma. What's the good work? What makes everyone so gay?' Lizzie looked up, a cover in one hand and a spoon in the other. Her face was so radiant that Jenny was still more mystified. "'Oh, Jenny, darling, your father has the money. He can make the payment to-morrow, and everything will come right.' So Jenny's plans recoiled upon herself. She had meant to tell her mother here and now that for four days past she had been Bob Colliam's wife and had a hundred dollars in her top bureau drawer. Her mother was to tell her father, and her father, Teddy and the girls. But now, well, what would be the use? By keeping her secret she might put off inevitable fate a little longer. "'Who lent it?' Jenny asked, after she had chosen her line of action. "'Nobody.' That's the wonderful part of it. It's a hundred and fifty dollars Teddy has earned. Earned? How? Selling bonds for a man he knows. He doesn't want anything said about it, because it's what he calls on the side. If the house knew of it, that he's working in off times for someone else, he might lose his job. But, oh, Jenny, isn't it wonderful? Jenny thought it wonderful for other reasons than Teddy's glory and the peace of the family mind. It was less easy to renounce Hubert than it had been an hour or two earlier. If he snapped his fingers, she had said to herself, while crossing the ferry, she would run to him like a dog, in spite of everything, and if she did it, she wanted to be free from the complications that must ensue if she were to proclaim herself Bob's wife. Having assented to her mother's praise of Teddy, she went back through the living room and on upstairs to take off her hat and coat. Near the top of the stairs the door of the bathroom opened suddenly, and Teddy appeared in his shirt-sleeves. There being nothing unusual in that, she was about to say, "'Hello, Ted,' and ascend the few remaining steps to her room. But seeing her moving upward in the dim hall light, Teddy started back within the bathroom, and with a movement he couldn't control, slammed the door noisily. The action was so odd that she called out to him, 
"'Tony Meagoose, what's the matter with you? Have you got the jumps?' The door opened, and Teddy reappeared, grinning sheepishly. I, I, "'I didn't have my coat on,' was the only explanation he could find. "'Dear, dear!' Jenny threw over her shoulder as she passed into her own room. "'We've got terribly modest all of a sudden, haven't we?' But weeks later she recalled this lame excuse. End of chapter 14Chapter 15 of The Empty Sack by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 15 During the next few days, Ray snapped his fingers twice, and on each occasion Jenny ran to him like a dog, as she had foreseen she would. The first time was in response to a telegram. The telegram said simply, Studio, Thursday, 3 p.m. There was no signature but Jenny knew what it meant. By one o'clock she was dressing feverishly. By two she had said good-bye to her mother and was on her way. She was not thinking of her twenty-five thousand dollars now, or of any offering up of herself. Her one objective was to drive that woman from the Byzantine chair, so that Hubert shouldn't look at her again. But she had not got out of Indiana Avenue on her way to the trolley-car, when something happened which had never happened in her life before. She received another telegram, the second in one day. The messenger boy, who was a neighbour's son, had hailed her from across the street. "'Hello, Jenny. Are you Miss Jane Scarborough Follett? That's a name and a half, ain't it?' Her first thought was that Hubert was wiring to put her off, because he wanted the other woman after all. Her second, that he had already addressed her as Miss Jenny Follett, and she doubted if he knew her full baptismal name. Only in one connection had it been used of late, and that recollection made her tremble. The message, too, was unsigned, and being so, it puzzled her. Always close to you in spirit, and loving you. That wasn't like Hubert, and Bob was on the sea. She walked slowly, reading it again and again, till her eyes caught the address in a corner. Havana. She remembered then that the Demerara was to touch at that port, and understood. Crushing the telegraphic slip into the bottom of her handbag, she made her way to the square, and took her place in the car. As she jolted down the face of the cliff, she wished that this message hadn't come till after her return from the studio. Then it wouldn't have mattered. It would have been too late to matter. Not that it mattered now, only that the way in which Bob expressed himself made her feel uneasy. Always close to you in spirit. She didn't want him to be close to her in any way, but in spirit least of all. Latterly she had heard Mrs. Weatherby, a convert to some school of new thought, discourse on the unreality of separations and the bridging power of spirit, and while these ideas made no appeal to her, they endued Bob's telegram with a ghostly creepiness. If he was close to her in spirit on an errand like the present one... So she turned back from the very studio door. She couldn't go in. She couldn't so much as put her hand on the knob. Knowing that Hubert was within a few yards of her, eager to be hers as she was to be his, she crept guiltily down the stairs. She cried all night from humiliation and repentance. It was as if Bob had laid a spell on her, and as she could break it, her life would be ruined. But the opportunity to break it came no later than the very next day. Chancing to look out into Indiana Avenue, she saw Hubert scanning number 11 from the other side of the street. He must indeed want to see her, since he had taken this journey into the unknown. Picking up a sunshade, she went out and spoke to him. He refused to come in, but begged her to take a little walk. "'Jenny, what's your game?' he asked roughly, as they sauntered down the avenue toward the edge of the cliff. "'Why don't you come to the studio when I ask you? What are you afraid of?' "'I did come the other day, but—' "'Why didn't you stay? I thought you would.' Brass, I wouldn't have minded it, and you could have seen how the thing is done. What's the good of seeing how it's done when, when you've got someone else? But, good Lord, Jenny, this is not the only picture of the kind I shall ever paint. Even if I go on using Emma for this, I shall want you for another one, and I'm not sure that I shall go on using Emma. Do you see? She was so perturbed that she launched on a question without knowing what she meant to ask. Isn't she? 
Oh, she's all right as far as the figure goes. Features coarse, not a bit what I'm trying to get. Have to keep toning down and modifying to give her the spiritual look that you've got, Jenny, to throw away. I keep thinking of you all the time I'm doing it. Look here, if you'll come tomorrow, I'll pay Brasshead off and you shall have the job. By the time they reached Palisade Walk, the business was settled on a business basis. Not once did he depart from the professional side of the affair, and not once did she allude to the scene in her dressing-room. But what was understood was understood, not less certain if it's being by passionate mental vibration, without a word, or a glance, or a pressure of the hand. But the next day, as Jenny was leaving the house to keep her appointment, Josiah, who had gone out as usual to look for work, had dragged himself home and fainted at the door. "'I'm all in,' he mumbled on his return to consciousness. "'I don't suppose I shall ever get a chance to do a day's work again.' Jenny was so much alarmed that she forgot to telephone her inability to go to the studio till after her father had been put to bed and the doctor had come and gone. "'Oh, it's all right,' Hubert had said listlessly. "'I didn't expect you. I knew that if it wasn't one excuse it would be another.' "'But I will come,' Jenny had interrupted tearfully. "'Do just as you like about that. Emma's here. "'And as you're so uncertain, I've decided to go on and finish the picture without making a change.' He put up the receiver on saying this, so that Jenny was left all in the air with her love and her distress. When Teddy appeared that evening, it was she who told him of their father's breakdown. "'The doctor says it's worry,' she explained, "'and lack of nutrition.' He says he must stay in bed a week, and we've got to feed him up and not let him worry again. Teddy's face grew longer and longer. Then we'll have to have more money. You poor Ted, yes. But then you're making money on the side, aren't you? Reminding himself, as he did a hundred times a day, that Nicholson had had five years in which to get away with it, Teddy passed on upstairs to his father's bedside. It's all right, Dad, he tried to smile. "'Don't you worry, I'm here. I'll take care of Ma and the girls. "'You just make your mind easy and give yourself up to getting well.' "'Jenny's attendance at the studio was thus put out of the question for many days, "'and in the meantime she had a letter posted at Havana. "'Fearing that it would come and attract attention in the family, "'she watched the postman getting it one morning before breakfast. "'Bob wrote.' There is a love so big and strong and sure that separations mean nothing to it, because it fills the world. That's my kind of love, Jenny, darling. You can't get out of it. I can't get out of it, even if we would. At this very minute I'm sailing and sailing, but I'm not being carried farther away from you. The love in which you and I are now leading our lives is wider than the great big circle made by the horizon. Don't forget that, dear. I'm always with you. Love doesn't recognise distance. Love isn't physical or geographical. It's force, power, influence. I love you so much that I know I can keep you safe even though I'm on the other side of the world. I can't fend troubles away from you, worse luck, but I can carry you through them. I know that till I come back you'll be having a hard time. But my love will hang round you like an enchanted cloak and, and nothing will really get at you. You're always wearing that cloak, Jenny. You always walk with it about you. While Jenny was reading this, Edith Collingham, at breakfast at Marillo Park, was springing a question on her father. She sprang it at breakfast because it was the only time she was sure of seeing him alone. Father, how far are children obliged to marry or not to marry in deference to their parents' wishes? And how far have fathers and mothers the right to interfere? Dofar, who was on his haunches near his master's knee, removed himself to a midway position between the two ends of the table, as if he felt that in the struggle he perceived to be coming he couldn't throw his influence with either side. Through the open window Max could be seen in perpetual motion on the lawn, yet pausing every two minutes to look wistfully down the avenue in the hope of some loved approach. Without answering at once, Collingham tapped an egg with a spoon. The broaching of so personal a question between one of his children and himself was something new. It had been an established rule in the household that, however free the intercourse between the boy and the girl and their mother, the approach to their father was always indirect. 
Junia had made it her lifelong part to explain the children to their father, and the father to his children, but rarely to give them a chance of explaining themselves to each other. Collium had acquiesced in this, for the reason that the duties of a parent were not those for which he felt himself, in his own phrase, specially cut out. The duties for which he did feel himself cut out were those that had to do with the investment of money. On this ground he spoke with authority. He was original, intuitive, inspired. When it came to a flare for the stock which was selling today at fifty and which tomorrow would be worth five hundred, he belonged to the Illuminati. This being the highest use of intelligence known to man, he felt it his duty to specialise in it, to the exclusion of everything else. As already hinted, there were two Collinghams. There was the natural man, a kindly, generous fellow who would never have made a big position in the world, and there was the other Collingham, standardised to the accepted, forceful, American businessman pattern, and who, now that he was sixty-odd, was the Collingham who mainly had the upper hand. Mainly, but not completely. The natural Collingham often made timid attempts to speak, and had to be stifled, he was being stifled, while the standardised Collingham tapped his egg. It was the pupil of Junior, Bickley, and the business world who finally sought to gain time by asking a counter-question. "'What do you want to know for?' Edith was prepared for this. "'Because I may make a marriage that you and Mother wouldn't like, and I think it possible that Bob may do the same.' Whatever the natural Collingham might have said to this, the man who had been evolved from him could have but one response. "'People who act on their own responsibility should be prepared to go the whole hog.' Edith sipped her coffee while she worked out the significance of this. "'Does that mean that you wouldn't give us any money? "'Rather, at being so extremely independent, you wouldn't ask for it?' "'Oh, ask for it, no, and yet... "'Do you think I ought to hand it out?' "'I was thinking rather of a kind of noblesse oblige.' in which all the noblesse must be mine. Not exactly that, in which perhaps the noblesse should be ours. Even if I should marry a poor man, I can't help being a Collingham, a member of a family with large ideas, and a large way of living. Yes, but you see, you'd be giving them up. You can't give up what's been bred into you. And in my case, I should be bringing the man, you must let me say it, Dad, I should be bringing the man I, I love so little... "'He's probably counting on a great deal. "'Poor men who marry rich men's daughters generally do. "'I was going to say that while he'd be giving me so much, "'all I could offer him would be money, and if I didn't bring that—' "'Well, go on. "'If I didn't bring that, I should feel so humiliated before him.' "'He affected an ignorance which was not a fact. "'Who is this paragon, anyhow?' "'I thought Mother might have told you. "'It's Mr. Ailing. "'Oh, that— "'Teacher fellow!' "'He's more than that, Dad. He's a professor in one of our greatest universities. He's a writer beginning to be recognised as having ideas. He has a position of his own. "'Yes, but only an intellectual one.' She raised her eyebrows. "'Only?' He straightened himself, and prepared for business. "'Look here, Edith, don't kid yourself. An intellectual position in this country is no position at all. The American people have no use for the intellectual, and they've made that plain.' She could hardly express her amazement. "'Why, Dad, there's no country in the world where people go in more for education, where there are more men who go to colleges, yes, to fit them for making money, not to turn them into highbrows. You must have a spade to dig a garden, but it's the garden you're proud of, not the spade. And the very president of the country is what you call an intellectual man, but that's a bit of chance. He's not president because he was a college professor, but because he was a politician.' If he hadn't been a politician, something that the country values, he'd still be rotting in some two-by-three university. Listen, Edith, he emphasised his point by the movement of his forefinger. We've a rule in business which is the test of everything. So long as you stick to it, you can't go wrong in your estimates. The value of a thing is as much money as it will bring. You know the value of the intellectual in American eyes the minute you think of what the American people is willing to pay for it. You say your intellectual man has a position of his own. Well, you can see how big the position is by what he earns. He doesn't earn enough decently to support a wife. And so long as the American people have anything to say to it, he never will. 
You can box the whole compass of fellows who live by their wits. Teachers, writers, journalists, artists, musicians, clergymen, and the whole tribe of them. We don't want them in this country, except as you want a spade and a hoe in your tool-house. When they try to get in, we starve them out. And, calling them as you are, once you've married this fellow, you'll go with your gang. He pushed back his chair and rose. That's all I've got to say. Think it over. As he passed out through the French window to the terrace beyond, he snapped his fingers. Dauphin, come along. But perhaps for the first time in his life, Dauphin didn't immediately follow him. Instead, he went first to Edith, laying his long nozzle in her lap. For five or ten minutes, as Colliam smoked his morning cigar while visiting the stables, the garage, and the kitchen garden, the natural man tried to raise his voice. "'Why didn't you say, "'Marry your man, Edith, my child, and I'll give you ten thousand a year?' "'Poor little girl,' this first Colliam went on. "'She's so frank and true and high-spirited. "'You've made her unhappy when you could so easily have made her glad.' "'You said what any other American father in your position would have said,' "'the pupil of Bickley and Junior argued on the other side. "'True, you've made her unhappy, but young people often have to be made unhappy "'in order that the foolish dictates of their heart may be repressed. "'There are millions of people all over the world whose lives would have been spoiled "'if such early emotional impulses hadn't been thwarted. "'And after all, it was true that the intellectual was not respected. "'The public pretended that it was.' but when it came to the test of social and financial reward, the only rewards there were, the pretense was apparent. There were no intellectual people at Morello Park. There were none whom he, Collingham, knew in business. There were men with brains, but to distinguish them from the intellectual, they were described as brainy. Edith, as the wife of an intellectual man, would be self-destroyed, and it was his duty as her father to stop, if he could, that self-destruction. By the time he reached the point in his morning ritual which brought him to Junior's bedside, he was standardised again, even though it was with a bleeding heart. He could more easily suffer a bleeding heart than he could the fear of not being an efficient man of business. "'What use have you had for the twenty-five thousand I've paid into your account?' he asked before he kissed her good-bye. She concealed her anxiety that so many days had passed without a sign from Jenny under an air of nonchalance. "'No use as yet, but I expect to have. "'I shall let you know when the time comes.' "'But no sign could come from Jenny, "'for the reason that her father died in mid-July, "'and during the intervening weeks she was tied to his bedroom. "'As the eldest daughter and the only one at home, "'all her other functions were absorbed in those of nurse. "'Luckily there was money in the house, "'for Teddy had been his successful in his efforts on the side.' and Bob continued to transmit small sums to herself, which she added to the hundred dollars in the top bureau drawer. Bob, Hubert, Collingham Lodge, her ambition, and her love, became unreal and remote as she watched the setting of the sun to which her being had been turned. In the eyes of others, Josiah might be feeble and a failure, but to Teddy and his sisters he was their father, the pivot of their lives, the nearest thing to a supreme being they had known. Lizzie's grief was different. Her heart didn't ache because he was dying. Life having become what it was, he was better dead. If she could have died herself, she would have gone to her rest gladly, had it not been for the children. For their sake, she remained sweet, calm, active, brewing and baking, sweeping and cleaning, sitting up at night with Josiah while they were asleep, and hiding the fact that instead of a heart, she felt nothing within her but a stone. Her grief was not for Josiah. It was for the futility of the best things human beings could bring to life. Honesty, industry, thrift, devotion, ambition, and romance had been the qualifications with which Josiah Follett and Lizzie Scarborough had faced the world, and this was the best the world could do with them. "'It isn't as if we ever faltered or refused or turned aside,' she mused to herself as she hurried from one task to another. "'We've been absolutely faithful. We've had pluck in the face of every discouragement, and eaten ashes as if it were bread. And in the end 
we come to this. It makes no difference that we didn't deserve it. We get it just the same. Josiah's wanderings as his mind grew feebler turned forever round one central theme. A job, a job, to be allowed to work, to have a chance to earn a living. It was his kingdom of heaven, his forgiveness of sins, his paradise of God. In the middle of the night he would open his eyes and say, "'I've got a job, Lizzie, fifty a week.' "'Yes, yes,' Lizzie would say, drawing the cheat about his shoulders. "'Yes, yes, you'll go to town in the morning. "'Now turn over, dear, and go to sleep again.' These excitements were generally in the small hours of the morning. By day he was less cheerful. "'I'm all in, Jenny, darling,' he would say then. "'I don't suppose I'll ever get a chance to do a day's work again.' But one hot afternoon in the middle of July he woke from a long sleep with a look that startled her. Jenny had never seen the approach of death, but now that she did, she knew it could be nothing else. He had simply rolled over on his back, staring upward with eyes that had become curiously glassy and sightless. Jenny ran to the head of the stairs. "'Mamma, Mamma, come quick!' He said nothing till Lizzie had reached the bedside. Though he didn't move his head or look towards her, he seemed to know that she was there. "'Here's mother, Lizzie. He raised his hands while a look of glad surprise stirred over his face. "'There's a country,' he stammered on brokenly. "'No, it isn't a country. It's, it's like a town. They're, they're working. They've got well for me, and, and they've never... they've never fired.' The hands fell, but the look of glad surprise was only shut out of sight by the coffin lid. Teddy paid for the lot in the cemetery, as well as the other expenses of the funeral, within a week of his father's death. "'Now I'm through,' he said to himself, with a long sigh of relief. "'You darling Ted,' was Jenny's commendation, "'you must have given Mamma five hundred dollars at least. Now I hope you'll be able to save a little for yourself.' At the bank Teddy's younger colleagues were sympathetic, Lobley especially doing him kindly little turns. He asked him to supper one evening at a restaurant, where they talked of marksmanship, at which Teddy had been proficient in the Navy. He was out of practice now, he said, to which Lobley had replied that it was a pity. He, Lobley, had an automatic pistol, illegally, at home, and if Teddy would like to borrow it, he could soon bring himself back to his old form. Teddy did so like, and went back to Pemberton Heights with the things secreted on his person. It went with him to the bank next day, and every day. For Teddy had begun to notice symptoms to which one less keenly suspicious would be blind. Nothing was ever said of money missing, and no hint thrown out that he himself was not trusted as before. He had nothing to go on except that Mr. Brunt became more taciturn than ever, and once or twice he thought he was being watched. The eyes of Jackman, the principal house detective, wandered often towards him, and twice he, Teddy, had seen Jackman in conference with Flynn. "'They'll never get me alive,' was his inner consolation, though immediate suicide suggested itself as an alternative, and flight, disappearance, an absolute blotting out, was a third expedient. Yet nothing was sure, nothing was even remotely sure. By becoming too jumpy he might easily give himself away. Nicholson had had five years. In two years, in one, Teddy meant to be square with the bank again. But one afternoon, as he emerged into Broad Street on his way home, Jackman and Flynn were talking together on the opposite pavement. The boy jumped back, though not before he saw Jackman make a sign to Flynn which said as plainly as words, "'There he is now.' To Teddy it was the end of the world. All the past, all the future, merged into this single second of terror. He looked across at them, they looked across at him. There was a degree of confession in the very way in which his blanched face stared at them through the intervening crowds. Jackson's lips formed half a dozen syllables, emphasised by a nod and a lifting of the brows. "'That's the guy, all righty,' were the words Teddy practically heard. Like a startled wild thing, he had but one impulse, to run. Actual running in Broad Street at that hour of the day, being out of the question, he dived into the procession mounting towards Wall Street, ducking, 
dodging, pushing, almost knocking people down, and mad with fear. "'They'll never get me alive,' he was saying to himself. But how in that crowd to find space in which to turn the pistol to his heart already puzzled him. At the corner of Wall Street he summoned courage to look over his shoulder. They might not be after him. If not, it would prove a false alarm, such as he had had before. But there they were, Jackman scrambling laboriously up the other side of Broad Street, and Flynn, crossing it, picking his way among the vans and motor-cars. Like a frightened rabbit, Teddy scurried on again, meaning to gain Nassau Street, and somehow double on his tracks. End of chapter 15《Chapter Sixteen of The Empty Sack by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Sixteen. But Teddy did not double on his tracks in Nassau Street, for the reason that, in again looking over his shoulder, he saw that Flynn had taken one side of that thoroughfare and Jackman the other. They were burly men who moved heavily, while he, in spite of his stocky build, glided in and out among the pedestrians with the agility of a squirrel. He was putting distance between himself and them, and five minutes' leeway would be enough for him. All he needed was the space and privacy in which to shoot himself. At the corner of John Street he turned to the left and made toward Broadway. They would expect him to do this, his chief hope being that among the homing swarms they would already have lost sight of him. His mind was not working, he was not looking ahead, even over the few minutes he had still to live. All his instincts were fused into the fear of the hand of the law on his person. It was like Jenny's terror of the hand of a man she didn't love, a frenzy for physical sanctity stronger than the fear of death. At the same time, he couldn't run the risk of being more noticeable than the majority of people going his way. As he pushed and dodged, a young man whom he had jostled called out, in ironic good humour, "'Say, is the cop after you?' at which Teddy almost lost his head. He expected a crowd to gather, and three or four men to hold him by the arms, till Jackman and Flynn came up. But nothing happened. The protesting young man was lost in the scramble, and he, Teddy, found himself in Broadway. Paying no heed to the jam of street-cars, lorries, private cars, and motor-trucks, he dashed into the interlaced streams of traffic. He dashed, and was held up. He dashed again, and was held up a second time. He was held up a third time, a fourth, and a fifth— with every spurt of two or three feet, cries warned him, and curses startled him. "'Say, Sonny, your ma must have lost you,' came from a jocko's chauffeur, beside whose machine Teddy had been brought to a halt. "'I don't well like to run over you,' shouted the driver of a van, who had narrowly escaped doing it. Teddy wished he had. If he could only be sure of being killed, it might have been the easiest way out. Reaching the opposite pavement, he had time to see that Jackman had crossed lower down, and more easily than he, and was lumbering towards him from the downtown direction. Jackman could have shouted to the passers-by to lay hold of Teddy, only that, from a distance and among such numbers, he couldn't indicate his victim. Being younger than Flynn, and of lighter build, he could move in his own way almost with Teddy's rapidity. The boy didn't dare to run, because the action would have marked him out, but he started again on his snake-like gliding between pedestrians. He must gain some doorway, some cellar, some hole of any sort, in which to draw his pistol. He would have drawn it there and then, only that a hundred hands would have seized him. All at once he saw the open portal of a great mercantile building, leading to a vast interior with which he was familiar. There were several exits and many floors. Once he had turned in here, he could cross the scent. In he went, with scores who were doing likewise, passing scores who were coming out. His first intention was to avoid the conspicuous exit towards Day Street, and make for the less obvious one into Fulton Street. But in doing that he passed a line of some twenty lifts, of which one was about to close its door. He slipped into it like a hare into its warren. The door clanged, the lift moved upward with an oily speed. Among his companions he was hot, flurried, breathless, and yet not more so than any other young clerk who had been doing an errand against time. There were nearly thirty floors, and he got off at the twenty-third. He chose the twenty-third so as not to get off too soon, and yet not to call attention to himself by remaining in the lift when most of its occupants had left it. 
The floor was spacious and almost empty. A few people were waiting for a lift to take them down. A few were going in and out of offices, but otherwise he had the place to himself. Mechanically he walked to a window and looked out. He seemed to be up in the sky, with only the tops of a few giant cubes on a level with himself. Skyscrapers, they were called, and skyscrapers they seemed up here even more than down below. The tip of the great city, the stretches of the bay, the green slopes of Staten Island, and the far-off colossal woman with a torch, were all within his vision, with the oblique strip that was Broadway a tiny, ugly gash in which bacteria were squirming, deep down and cutting across the foreground. Except for the dull roar that came up and the clang of an occasional footstep along the hallways, it was so still and pleasant that the need to shoot himself seemed for the minute less insistent. It would have to be done sooner or later, but when it comes to suicide, even a few minutes' respite is something. He could have done the thing right there and then by the window, where the few people within hearing would have run to him at sound of the shot. If the shot didn't kill him, they would keep him from firing another. Publicity, distasteful in itself, might lead to ineffectuality. He must find a lavatory, and so began walking up and down the corridors, looking at doors discreetly placed in corners. When he came to his objective, it was locked. Again, it was reprieve. The same door would be on other floors, but he was not ready for the moment to forsake his shelter. It was true that at any minute Flynn and Jackman might emerge from the lift, but there were nearly thirty chances that they had followed him so closely they would not select this landing. Even more were the chances that they had not seen him slip into the building at all. Fevered and thirsty, he stooped to drink at the fountain, crowning the head of a little bronze woman with a pair of dolphins on her shoulders. She seemed to be of Maya type, and a uniformed guardian had once told him that a great modern sculptor had moulded her. With the difference in dolphins, she was repeated on every floor, forever diademed in water. Teddy's mind had so far suspended operation as to his immediate plight, that he went back to the morning, seven or eight months previously, when an errand from Mr. Brunt had brought him into the great ground-floor atrium, revealing the Basilica Julia, or the Basilica Emilia, of ancient Rome restored right there in Lower Broadway. Simplicity, immensity, the awesome beauty of mere form— the wide spaces, the mighty columns, the tempered white light of majestic Roman windows, the absence of striving for effect, the peace, the restfulness, the cheerfulness, when striving for effect are abandoned, dwarfing the magnitude of crowds, and reducing their ebbings and flowings to mere vanity. Like Jenny with her emotions, like Pansy with her intuitions, Teddy had no words for these impressions, but the Scarborough tradition, nursed on ancient Rome restored, vibrated to their music. "'And here I am, trapped like a rat in a hole.' So he came back to it. He wondered if he were awake. Was it possible that ten or fifteen minutes could have transformed him from a hard-working, home-loving boy into a fugitive who had no choice left but to shoot himself? As for facing the disgrace, he did not consider it. To stand before his mother, charged with theft, even if it was on her behalf, was not to be thought of. He couldn't do it, and there was an end to it. Still less could he go through the other incidentals, handcuffs, a cell, the court, the sentence, Bitterwell, and the lifetime that would come after his release. He could put the pistol to his heart, and, if necessary, he could burn in hell, if there was a hell, but he couldn't do the other thing. And yet, to put the pistol to his heart and burn in hell, formed a lamentable choice on their side. "'I'm not a thief,' he protested inwardly. "'I took the money. How could I help it with Dad sick and Ma at the end of everything? But I'm not a thief!' He was sure of that. It became a formula not perhaps of comfort, but of justification. Had he been a thief, he told himself, he could have faced the music but it was precisely because he had taken money while preserving his inner probity that he refused to be judged by the standards of men. Once more he couldn't express it in this way to himself, but it was the conclusion to which his instincts leaped. Only one tribunal could discern between the good and evil in his case, so he was resolved to go before it. 
In a quiet corner he began to cry. He was only a boy, with a boy's facility of emotion, especially of distress. He cried at the thought of his mother and the girls, with no one to fend for them, and no Teddy coming home in the evenings. It was true that, apart from his filchings, he had been able to fend for them only to the extent of eighteen per, but there was always a chance of better days ahead. Even at the worst of times they had a good deal of fun among themselves, and now... Now his mother would be in the kitchen, beginning to get supper, and each of the girls would be making her way back to Indiana Avenue. Pansy's dog clock would tell her when to watch for them, and the loving little creature would be eyeing the door, ready to welcome each of them in turn. If she had a preference, it was for himself, and the feeling of her gentle paws against his shin was connected with the tenderest things he knew. No, it wasn't possible. He couldn't be skied on that twenty-third floor, unable to come down, unable to go home. It must be a nightmare. Such things didn't happen. He was Teddy Follett, a, a good boy at heart, with an honourable record in the Navy. He would never meant to steal, but what could he do? The money was there, to be stacked in the vaults of Collingham and Laws, not to be touched for months, very likely, and the home needs imperative. He couldn't see his father and mother turned out of house and home because they couldn't pay their taxes. It was not in common sense. Nothing was in common sense. That he should be dragged into court, that his mother should break her heart, that shame would be showered on his sisters, was ridiculous. Somewhere in the universe there was a great big principle that was on his side, though he didn't know what it was. What he did know was that crying was unmanly. Sopping up his tears and trying not to think, he jumped into the first lift that stopped, and got out at floor eleven. There he went straight to the lavatory, which he now knew how to place, and once more found the door locked. Though again it was reprieve, it was reprieve almost unwelcome. The first passing lift was going upward, and so he ascended to floor seventeen. Here again the lavatory was locked, as it was on floors nineteen and twenty-five, both of which he tried. He began to understand that they were locked according to a principle, and that for those seeking privacy in which to shoot themselves they offered no resource. Moreover, offices were closing and the great building emptying itself rapidly. The rush was all to the lifts going downward. He too must go downward. To be found skulking in corridors where he had no business would expose him to suspicion. After nearly an hour spent above, he descended to the atrium, where Flynn and Jackman might be watching the cages disgorge, knowing that in time he must appear from one of them. But he walked out without interference. A far hint of twilight was deepening the atmosphere round the heads of the great columns, and the waning sunshine spoke of workers seeking rest. Dreams of men and women, mostly young, were setting toward each of the exits, to Broadway, to Fulton Street, to Day Street, and he had only to drop into one of them. He chose that toward Day Street, finding himself in the open air, in full exercise of his liberty. Once more it was hard to believe that there was a difference between this day and other days. It would have been so natural to go to the gym for a plunge or a turn with the foils, and then home to supper. He discussed with himself the possibility of a last night with the family, recalling only from the fact that it was precisely there that they would look for him. Much reading of criminal annals had printed that detail on his brain. The poor wretch torn from the worn shelter of his home, with his wife's arms round him and the baby sleeping in the cradle. There was no wife or baby in this case, but to have the thing happen to himself, with his mother and the girls vainly trying to stay the course of the law, would be worse than going to the chair. He was in the uptown subway with no outward difference between himself and the scores of other young men scanning the evening papers. Because he didn't know what else to do, he got out at Chambers Street. He got out at Chambers Street because there was a ferry there which would take him over to New Jersey. He went over to New Jersey because it was his habit at this hour of the day, and to follow his habit somehow preserved his sanity. To be on the same side of the river as his home was a faint, futile consolation. And while on the ferryboat, a new idea came to him. In the Erie station, he should find a telephone booth from which he could ring up his mother and inform her that he was not to be home that night. Though it would do no good in the end, it would at least save her from immediate alarm. 
Flynn and Jackman were unknown by face to the family, and if they rang at the door in search of him, they would probably not tell their tale. Before he reached the other side, he had concocted a story of which his only fear was as to his ability to tell it on the wire without breaking down. It was a bit of good luck to be answered by Gladys, whom he could bluff more easily than the rest of them. "'Hello, Gladys, this is Ted. Tell Ma I'm in Patterson and shall not get home to-night or to-morrow night.' He could hear Gladys calling into the interior of the house. "'Well, what do you know about that? Ted's at Patterson are not coming home to-night or to-morrow night.' Into the receiver he said, "'But, Ted, what do they say at the bank?' "'Oh, I may not go back to the bank. This is a new job. You remember the fellow I was working for on the side? Well, he's put me into this, and perhaps I'm going to make money.' "'Oh, Ted!' Gladys called delightedly. "'How many plunks?' "'It isn't a salary,' he stammered. "'I I may be in the firm. "'Tomorrow I may have to go to Philadelphia. "'Tell Ma not to worry and, and not to miss me. "'I'll try to call up from Philadelphia, but if I can't... "'Well, anyway, give my mouth to Ma and everybody, "'and if I'm not home the day after tomorrow, "'don't think anything about it.' "'He put up the receiver before Gladys could ask any more questions "'and felt ready to cry again. "'In order not to do that, he walked out of the station into the street, where the presence of the crowds compelled him to self-control. Having nothing to do and nowhere to go, he walked on and on, getting some relief from his desolation by the mere fact of movement. So he walked and walked and walked, headed vaguely towards the outskirts of the town. There were vast marshes there into which he could stray and be lost. The rank grasses in this early August season were almost as high as his shoulders, so that he could lie down and be beyond all human ken. His body might not be found for weeks, might never be found at all. Teddy Follett would simply disappear, his fate remaining a mystery. Towards seven o'clock the shabby suburbs began to show their primrose-coloured lights, a twinkle here, a twinkle there, stringing out in longer streets to scatter bits of garland. Teddy felt hungry. Counting his money, and finding that he had two dollars and thirty-one cents, he was sorry not to be able to transmit the two dollars to his mother. Growing more and more hungry, and knowing he must keep up his nerve, he spied a little bread and pastry shop just where the houses were thinning out and the marshes invading the town, as the ocean invaded the marshes. On entering, he asked for two tongue sandwiches and half a dozen doughnuts. The woman who wrapped up the sandwiches and dropped the doughnuts into a paper bag was an English-speaking foreigner of the Scandinavian type, blonde, dumpy, with a row of bad teeth and piercing blue eyes. As she performed her task, she seemed not to take her eyes from off him, though her smile was kind, and she caught his attention to the fact that she was giving him seven doughnuts for his six. "'You don't live front here?' she asked, in counting out the change for his dollar. "'No, just going up the road.' "'Well, call again,' she said politely, as he took his parcels and went out. Having eaten his two sandwiches, he felt better, in the sense of being stronger and more able to face the thing that had to be done. He was not quite out on the marshes, the long, flat road cutting straight across them to the nearest little town. The lights were rarer, but still there were lights, their saffron growing more and more luminous as the colours of the sunset paled out. An occasional motor passed him, but never a man on foot. He could have turned in anywhere, and perhaps for that reason he put off doing so. It would be easier, he argued, to shoot himself after dark. It was not dark as yet, only the long August gloaming. Moreover, the tramping was a relief, soothing his nerves and working off some of his horror. He wished he could go on with it, on and on, into the unknown, where he would be beyond recognition. But that was just where the trouble was. For the fugitive from justice, recognition always lay in wait. He had often heard his father say that in the banking business you could get away with a thing for years and years, and yet recognition would spring on you when least expected. As for himself, recognition could meet him in any little town in New Jersey. They would have his picture in the paper by tomorrow. And besides, what was the use? The dark was undeniably falling, when he noticed on the right a lonely shack with nothing but the marsh all round it. 
Coming nearly abreast of it, he detected a rough path toward it through the grass. He had no need of a path, no need of a shack. But the path and the shack being there, they offered something to make for. Since he was obliged to turn aside, he might as well do it now. So aside he turned. The path was hardly a path, and had apparently not been used that year. Wading through the dank grasses which caught him about the feet, he could hear small living things hopping away from his tread, or a marsh bird rise with a frightened whirr of wings. Water gushed into his shoes, but that, he declared, wouldn't matter, as he would so soon be out of the reach of catching cold. The building proved to be all that fire had left of a shanty knocked together long ago, probably for labourers working on the road. The walls were standing, and it was not quite roofless. There was no door, and the window was no more than a hole. But as he ventured within, he found the flooring sound. At least it bore his weight. And what was more amazing still, he tripped over a rough bench which the fire had spared, and the former occupant had not thought worth the carting away. It was the very thing. Shooting oneself was something to be performed with ritual. You lay down, stretched yourself out, and did it with a hint of decency. Teddy groped his way. First he drew the pistol from his hip pocket, laying it carefully on the floor, and within reach of his hand. Next he sat down for a minute, but fearing he would begin to think, lifted his feet to the bench, lowered his back, and straightened himself to his full, flat length. Putting down his hand, he found he could touch the pistol easily, and therefore let it lie. He let it lie only because he had not yet decided where to fire, at his heart or into his temple. Outside the hut there was a hoarse, sleepy croak, then another, and another, and another. The dangers of light being past, the frogs were waking to their evening chant. Teddy had always loved this dreamy, monotonous lullaby, reminiscent of spring twilights and approaching holidays. He was glad now that it would be the last sound to greet his ears on earth. Since he had to go, it would croon to him softly, cradle him gently, letting the night of the soul come down on him consolingly. He was not frightened. He was only tired, oddly tired, considering where he was. It would be easier to fall asleep than do anything else. They seemed to the quacks, quacks, quacks with which the darkness round was filled. And, right at that minute, Flynn, with low chuckles of laughter, was telling Mrs. Flynn of the extraordinary adventure of the afternoon. "'We didn't have nothing on the young guy at all till we seen him look over at us scared-like, and he took to his heels.' It was a cosy scene, Flynn in his shirt-sleeves and slippers, smoking his pipe in the dining-room of a Harlem apartment, while his wife, a plump, pretty woman, was putting away the spoons and forks in the drawer of the yellow oak sideboard. The noisy Flynn children being packed off to bed, the father could unbend and become confidential. It's about three weeks now since Jackman put me wise to money leaking from Collingham and Laws, and we couldn't tell where the hole was. First we'd size up one fellow, and then another. But we'd say it couldn't be him or him. We looked over this young follet with the rest, but only with the rest, and found but one thing again him. Didn't he lose his father a short while back? Yes, and that was what made us think of him. Old Follett was far from the bank eight or nine months ago, and yet the family had gone on living very much as they always done. That'd be to their credit, wouldn't it? Mrs. Flynn suggested kindly. It'd be to someone's credit, and the thing we wanted to know was if it was to Collingham and Laws. But we hadn't a thing on him. We found out he'd paid for the old man's funeral, and the grave, and all that. But whether their old folly had left a little wad, or whether the young guy had found it lying around loose, we couldn't make out at all. And then this afternoon, as Jackman and me was talking it over on the other side of Broad Street, who should come out but me little lord? Well, one look gives the whole show away. The third degree couldn't have been neater. The very eyes of him when he's seen us on the other side of the street says, My God, they've got me. So off he goes, and off we goes up Broad Street, into Wall Street, across to Nassau Street, up Nassau Street, round the corner to John Street, up to Broadway, over Broadway, and then we lost him. But we've done the trick. Tomorrow, when he comes to the bank, we'll have him on the grill. Sooner or later he'd been on the grill anyhow. But suppose he doesn't come? 
Ah, oh, that'll be a worse giveaway than ever. She turned from the drawer, asking of the Follett family and learning whatever he had to tell. And you say he's a fine boy of about twenty-one? Yeah, that'll be about his age. Yes, a fine upstanding lad, and very popular with Jackman he's always been. She waited a minute before saying, Oh, Peter, I wish you'd let him off. Now, ah, now, Tessie, he expostulated, there you go again. If you had your way, there'd be no law at all. Well, I wish there wasn't. He laughed with a jolly guffaw. If there was no law and no one to break it, where'd your trip to the beach be this summer, and the new Ford car I'm going to get for the boys? Anyhow, even if we do get him with the goods on him, which we're pretty sure of doing now, he'll be recommended to mercy on account of his youth, and perhaps be let off with two years. Yes, and what'll he be when he comes out? Getting up, he pulled her to him with his arm across her shoulders. Ah, now, Tessie, don't be looking so far ahead. That's you all over. And he kissed her. Gladys, that evening, kissed her mother, in the hope of kissing away her foreboding. Lizzie had not been satisfied with Teddy's story on the telephone. I don't understand why he didn't ask to speak to me, she kept repeating. Oh, Mamma, Gussie explained to her, don't you see, it was a long-distance call. Three minutes is all he was allowed, and of course he didn't want to pay double. Here's his chance to make money that we've all been praying for since the year one, and you pull a long face over it. Cheer up, Mamma, do smile, smile more. There, that's better. Ted said to himself that you were not to miss him. So Lizzie did her best to, to smile, only saying in her heart, I don't understand his not speaking to me. End of chapter 16